welcome to VLMD Rounds, a podcast on medical science and tools to optimize your health. I'm Dr. Vivian Lowe. The last episode I did was on brain insulin resistance, and I must say I was a little surprised at the uh, interest in the topic. I hadn't quite expected that. The way I decide on what episodes to make is almost somewhat random. So um, I had just done an interview with Casey Ruff on Boundless Body Radio Podcasts, and um, it was a lot of fun. He's an amazing host, and we had a really good time chatting. And somewhere in the interview, I had said, oh, well, probably at some point down the line, I'll do an episode on central versus peripheral insulin. Well, after filming uh, that interview, I went about my day and then later that day I had to make my newsletter, which I put out once a month. And in the newsletter, I usually give people a heads up on the upcoming episodes for the month. It's a tentative list, but nonetheless, it's just, you know, something to keep me organized in my brain. So sitting there and I was like, oh, what am I going to talk about this coming month? And because I just mentioned that on that interview, I said, ah, central versus peripheral insulin, why not? And I threw it in there. And then when it came time to record, I just went, oh, okay, that's on the list. I do try to follow the list. Sometimes I shift the order. Um, And then I made that episode. So I was almost doing it just kind of off the top of my head. I was surprised at the amount of interest that people had in the topic. Now, I post whenever um, a new episode comes out. I let people know through LinkedIn. And I had posted um, that this episode had just come out. And I got many comments. And I think there was quite a lot of interest. But um, there was someone there who, you know, kind of, Uh, commented on my post and we had a little bit of a conversation going and uh, at one point I said well you know if people are interested in brain metabolism maybe I'll do an episode on that at some point and she responded oh I'm looking forward to it Um, uh, so uh, Ethelene, I believe, that's how you say your name. I hope I got it right. Ethleen, uh, this episode is for you because I thought, well, it makes sense to follow up that last episode with brain metabolism. So let's go. Um, just one thing to qualify this episode. I am just going to give a brief overview. And there are many details and it's really quite complex. So just want you to understand we're just kind of going over the surface and there's still many questions that need to be answered, but this is a good start into looking at brain metabolism. Okay, so I think most people know that in the brain, we use glucose as a fuel. You can also use ketone bodies Um, and you know, that's why people, for example, go on a ketogenic diet. However, you can't actually replace all the glucose with ketone bodies. And we think that if you have ketone bodies that can, you know, provide about 30% of the energy for the brain, but you absolutely do need glucose as well. And so the brain... Um, really is um, an obligate user of glucose for substrates, okay, for making energy. And the brain is complex. It's not so easy because metabolism in the brain is cell specific. And you'll, you'll see what I mean in a minute. So let's just quickly talk about how we get glucose into the brain since it's really necessary for brain function, all right? And we basically have those uh, glucose transporters, remember the glutes 
uh, that we talked about in earlier episodes. So we have GLUT1 and GLUT3 at the blood-brain barrier, and these really are important for transporting glucose into the brain. And there may be other little mechanisms, but um, we think that most of the glucose gets into the brain via those transporters. And we have GLUT1, GLUT3. GLUT3 mostly in neurons, and then GLUT1 in other cells in the brain. I want to stress that this doesn't mean that neurons don't have GLUT1, okay? They have other GLUTs. There are other GLUTs also expressed in the brain. But primarily, we have GLUT3 in the neurons, and then other cells in the brain, we see more of GLUT1. Okay, and the idea was that the brain depends on glucose as an energy substrate, and it is, you know, basically fully oxidative metabolism that we see. So we are going to maximize the energy that we produce, right? by um, using sort of oxidative respiration in the brain. So we look at something called the oxygen um, to oxygen consumption or uptake to glucose consumption ratio. Now, if your brain were fully oxidative, 100% oxidative, then that ratio should be six, right? Because we're gonna need six oxygen atoms to oxidize the six carbons in the glucose, okay? So if it were fully oxidative in the brain, that's what we should see. However, when we do measurements, we actually do the experiment and we measure this, it turns out to be 5.5. So what's really going on? Now, we know from rodent studies that um, the brain does extract glucose from the arterial side of the blood circulation, right? And whatever it doesn't use, it basically excretes into the venous drainage, okay? So it doesn't store any of this glucose. It uses it, and whatever it doesn't use, it just kind of lets it go into the venous circulation. So what's going on here? How come we have ratios that don't match? And we got a clue when we had this honeybee uh, retina model. This is the first model that hinted at metabolic compartmentalization in the brain. And by that, we mean that the metabolism in different cell types in the brain um, is very different, okay? It's not the same throughout the brain. We're used to talking about the brain and we say, oh, okay, brain metabolism, but actually it's specific to the cell types in the brain. That's what makes it kind of complex, all right? So in that original honeybee model, it was um, basically the original model that kind of was the predecessor of the lactate shuttle model. And by this, what they found was that they could separate the glial elements in the honeybee retina, right, from the neural elements. And the glia, for now, just think of them as the non-neural parts of the brain, okay? And what they noted was that really the glia were taking up most of the glucose. Take that glucose and they run it through um, glycolysis, make pyruvate, and then from pyruvate, we make alanine, all right? And that alanine now can be transferred to the neural side, the photoreceptor, right? And that in the photoreceptor, the alanine is converted back to pyruvate and then can enter into the TCA cycle, okay? And that made us realize all of a sudden, ooh, it's not the same throughout the whole brain. And this is where the idea of metabolic compartmentalization came about. So we have the neurons in the brain. These are really the cells that 
you know, conduct impulses, right? They fire, the membranes depolarize, and we have nerve conduction through the neurons, okay? But we also have supporting cells in the brain, and these are called glial cells, okay? The noun is glia, G-L-I-A. And actually that word means glue because originally they were just thought of as uh, these very uninteresting cells and their only function is to hold the brain together so we don't have like a, a mush here, right? So they're almost like just the connective tissue of the brain holding the brain together. But later on, we found out that the glia were way more interesting than just being um, cells that held the brain together. So an analogy I'd like to use is if you've ever been to a concert with your favorite artist, okay? So whoever that might be, maybe, you know, you're going to a Rihanna concert or Lady Gaga or Beyonce, you know, you've got tickets and you go, right? Uh, the idea is, you know, generally these artists, they're top of their game and they put up quite a good show, right? But in order for them to have that amazing show, there are all these backup uh, crew members that are involved. So you have the makeup artists, you have the people doing hair, you have the people doing lighting on the stage and sound, for example. Those backup dancers, they're working their butts off, right, to create energy and generate excitement, right? So that by the time the artist steps out to do her piece, right, we have this amazing package that comes together and this allows the audience to have a wonderful experience at the show, right? So it's not just the artist, as talented as they might be, the show is not the same without all the other stuff and all the other crew members that go into, um, you know, giving you that experience. And this is really what the glial cells do. So we have different types of glial cells. We have microglia, and they're very interesting because they are actually immune cells in the brain, and they have. Uh, immunologic functions, but they also kind of have housekeeping functions in the brain. Very interesting, and I'll probably do a whole episode on microglia at some point. We have oligodendrocytes, and these tend to the axons and make sure that they're myelinated properly, right, so that we have uh, proper nerve conduction. And then we also have astrocytes, okay? So these astrocytes also have uh, very important functions. They're involved with uh, metabolic functions in the brain, homeostasis. They're involved with neuroplasticity, right? And um, general housekeeping in the brain as well. Now, the neurons actually take up 80 to 90% of the total energy consumption in the brain, right? And yet, in the basal resting stage. Neurons at most take up the same amount of glucose as the astrocytes, okay? So even though they are the ones, the cells that require the most energy, we see that in the resting stage, oh, they're not really taking up that much glucose. At best, they're taking up about the same amount as the astrocytes. And during activation of those neurons, then there's really an increase in glucose uptake in the brain, but not necessarily by the neurons. In fact, this increase in glucose uptake is mostly by astrocytes, okay? So we're going to look a little bit more at the astrocytes. So if you think of um, the synapse, right? A neuronal synapse. We think of the presynaptic part, right? And generally, you know, when the, the um, nerve fires and you have depolarization of the membrane, you end up releasing neurotransmitters from the presynaptic uh, part 
into the synapse and then that neurotransmitter can be taken up by the postsynaptic membrane all right so generally we've thought of it as a two-part uh, system with the presynaptic part and the postsynaptic part but in reality um, it's probably more accurate to think of it as what we call the tripartite synapse okay because there are three members involved we have the presynaptic part we have the postsynaptic uh, part but we also have an intervening cell and that would be the astrocyte okay and that's why we call it the tripartite synapse now the astrocyte just to let you know it's not just at one synapse okay an astrocyte may be in contact with like up to two million synapses in your brain okay so it's a very busy cell and very important as well and we have what is called metabolic coupling between the neuron and the astrocyte okay so the idea as i told you is that the astrocytes are going to take in most of the glucose okay increase uptake but this is by the astrocytes and what are they doing with this glucose well actually what the astrocytes do is that they're going to run that glucose through glycolysis and of course we end up with pyruvate okay and then you know from previous episodes and just from your own knowledge base, we can do a number of things with pyruvate, right? It can enter into the Krebs cycle. So, and then we can generate you know, 32 to 36 ATPs that way. All right, so if we go through Krebs, that's one option. The other thing you can do, um, let's say in conditions of low oxygen, right? Hypoxic conditions, you can have anaerobic um, fermentation and so you take that pyruvate and you make lactate all right but we also know that you know we don't actually just need hypoxic or low oxygen conditions for this to happen that we can have what is generally termed aerobic glycolysis where under normal oxygen conditions we take pyruvate and we form lactate Okay, so this is actually what is happening in the astrocytes. They're taking in the glucose, running it through glycolysis. We end up with, lac uh, with pyruvate, and that pyruvate is converted to lactate. All right, let's look at the differences between the astrocyte and the neurons. Because when we look at metabolism, we're going to actually see primarily glycolytic processes with lactate formation in the astrocyte. In comparison, in the neurons, you're actually gonna have more oxidative metabolism, okay? So that's gonna be the main difference between the different cell types. But what is it that causes that difference? Well, one thing is the enzyme profiles are different between the two cells, okay? So we have, for example, uh, in the astrocyte, right, pyruvate dehydrogenase, and the pyruvate dehydrogenase in the astrocytes are highly phosphorylated. And so it's going to favor the pyruvate instead of entering into the Krebs cycle, it's going to favor the pyruvate being uh, moved towards forming lactate. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is that we have, you know, when you when you convert pyruvate to lactate, that is through an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase, and you have different isoforms of that enzyme. So in the astrocyte, you have lactate dehydrogenase 5, okay? And that preferentially drives also lactate to, I'm sorry, pyruvate to lactate, okay? In the uh, neuron, you primarily have lactate dehydrogenase 1, and that's going to drive pyruvate into the Krebs cycle. So these different enzyme profiles, right, different forms of the enzyme, 
make a big difference. In addition, we have different mitochondrial respiratory complexes uh, in astrocytes, okay? So remember the electron transport chain that I talked about in way back in episode one. Well, that feels like years ago. But I talked about it when I tried to introduce this idea of metabolism. And you know that in the electron transport chain, you have the electron being passed on from one element to another until you get to the final electron acceptor, which should be oxygen, right? Now, we have these complexes that are basically passing the electrons through in this chain, okay? And they are bunched together to make up a super complex to make it easy for that transfer to happen. Well, in astrocytes, complex one is uncoupled from the super complex. So it's not kind of, you know, bunched up in close proximity with the rest of the super complex. So it's uncoupled. And as a result, we have poor mitochondrial respiration. Okay, so it doesn't work as well in um, the astrocyte. Whereas in the neuron, we have complex one right there in that super complex. And so we have very good mitochondrial respiration. So we see these differences there. And one other thing is that astrocytes have high reducing potential. So the NADH to NAD plus ratio is high. And this is going to drive the reaction of pyruvate to lactate, okay? So it's much higher, the NADH to NAD ratio is much higher in the astrocytes as compared to neurons. Now, I talked about all these things in episode one, um, and really it's because they're really important if you are talking about metabolism, because all the time people think about metabolism and we make ATP and so forth, but you know, <laughs> these redox potentials and so on, the transfer of these protons and electrons, these are very important here, okay, as you'll see. All right, so let me finish up what goes on. So we made lactate, right? Because of these differences in the astrocyte, we're driving the pyruvate towards lactate formation. Now this lactate gets exported out of the um, astrocyte into the extracellular space. And it does so through these monocarboxylate transporters or MCTs, that's the short form, okay? And in the astrocytes, we have MCT1 and we have MCT4, okay? So we shuttle out the lactate that way into the extracellular space. And then in the neurons, we have MCT2. Okay, MCT2 really has high affinity for lactate. It's going to grab that lactate and bring it into the neuron. Okay, now once we have lactate in the neuron, that lactate is converted back to pyruvate. Pyruvate can enter the TCA cycle, and then we have oxidative metabolism going on there. All right, so that's how we can preferentially divert energy to the neuron when we actually pass this lactate over, okay? So that really is the basis of what we call the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle, ANLS, okay? The astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle. But what's really driving this, okay? And the answer is glutamate. So glutamate is a neurotransmitter. Okay, so remember you have depolarization of uh, the neuron, right? And then we get to the presynaptic membrane and then we're gonna release glutamate, the neurotransmitter, into the extracellular space, which is the synapse at that point, right? And then we have receptors on the postsynaptic membrane to pick up that glutamate. But most of the glutamate is actually gonna be in the synapse. Okay, you can't have that glutamate just hang out in the synapse because we got to clean it up for the next um, depolarization, okay? So we've got to get rid of that glutamate. And guess who is part of the cleanup? Who's involved? 
the astrocyte, right? So you can think of the astrocyte as the fixer. Okay, neuron, you made a mess. Lots of glutamate around. And now I gotta mop it up. Okay, so it's gonna mop up the glutamate by taking it in. So astrocyte is taking it in, into itself, into the astrocyte, right? And it does so through a system that involves bringing sodium into the astrocyte as well. Okay, this is not good. You know why? Because now we've disrupted the ion gradient in the astrocyte. Remember, I said ion gradients are very important, okay? And again, when we think of energies, not just ATP, you gotta think of membrane potentials and ion gradients and so forth, okay? So now we have disrupted the ion gradient. And normally, you know, we have more sodium outside the cell, okay? So ooh, okay, we're gonna need ATP to pump that sodium back out because we had to bring the sodium in as we brought in the glutamate, okay? Now, so now we've got to get rid of that sodium, pump it out, and that's going to cost us ATP, right? Now, the other thing that's going to happen is we just brought in this glutamate. What are we going to do with it? Well, we're going to make glutamine with it, right? We'll convert that glutamate to glutamine, okay? And then now that we have glutamine, we can take that glutamine and we can release it to the extracellular space and then, guess what? The neurons can then pick up that glutamine and bring it into uh, themselves and make glutamate from that glutamine. The glutamine uh, is metabolically inert, right? So it's not like glutamate. Now we've mopped up the glutamate, which is the neurotransmitter. We're releasing glutamine. Okay, that's not gonna do anything, but it supplies the neuron with a substrate to make more glutamate, okay? See how smart that is? Okay, that's great, except it's gonna cost energy. Everything costs money, right? Everything costs energy. So it's gonna cost energy to take this glutamate and make glutamine uh, from it, okay? So actually that glycolysis process and then taking the pyruvate to lactate will give us some of the ATPs uh, to actually offset um, bringing the glutamate in and then converting it to glutamine, okay? In addition, there's something else. There's always something else. Okay, remember when you depolarize the neuron membrane? Okay, and basically what happens is we now dump a lot of potassium into the extracellular space. Okay, but once we've depolarized, guess what? We have to reset the membrane potential. We gotta get rid of that potassium. And who do you think is gonna get rid of that potassium? Yes, the fixer cell, the astrocyte. So the astrocyte says, oh, okay. So it mops up the potassium as well. Okay, and as it mops up the potassium, there's something else that happens. So I'm going to transition now to another thing that I find amazing about the brain. When I first read about this, I was like, whoa. And, you know, generally when I discover something exciting like that, I just like run around. And of course, I tell Gris and I tell Anna and then, you know, I run out of people to tell and there's not a whole lot of people to uh, discuss that finding with. So one of the joys of doing this podcast is now I can share it with all of you. And it's this. We actually have glycogen in the brain. I'll say that again. We have glycogen in the brain. That blows my mind, okay? Yeah, glycogen, like the glycogen in your liver, the glycogen in your muscles. Yeah, we have some of that in the brain. And guess what? Pretty much glycogen in the brain is confined to astrocytes. Um, maybe, you know, maybe elsewhere, but really, mm, basically most of it in astrocytes, okay? Now, why is it in astrocytes? 
Okay, so when we actually take in the extracellular potassium, we are going to break down the glycogen. Okay, we're going to break down the glycogen and have glucose uh, one phosphate, right? And then with that, we're going to take the glucose and run it through. So the, the glycogen is broken down to glucose. And then we uh, run it through glycolysis. We make pyruvate. And from that pyruvate, we make lactate. All right. So pretty fascinating, isn't it? That we have glycogen in the brain and it's really important and you know potassium extracellular potassium ammonium nh4 plus and also nitric oxide will actually set about this process of glycogen breakdown to form lactate in the brain another thing that does that is actually um norepinephrine Okay, so some of these neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and uh, VIP, uh, vasointestinal, vasoactive intestinal peptide, yeah, uh, and adenosine and ATP can do that too, all right? Um, they do that by raising cyclic AMP levels uh, intracellularly, and then we have glycogen breakdown, right? And then we form lactate as a result okay so all these processes are driving the formation of lactate in the brain now you might say okay you know seems like a pretty roundabout way to get energy to neurons for example right and that's because you're only thinking of lactate as a fuel it turns out that lactate is more than just a fuel Lactate has important signaling properties. So besides thinking of lactate as a fuel, um, we really need to think of lactate now as uh, some, a signaling molecule. Okay? We probably should think of glycogen that way too, you know, because we're used to thinking of it as a storage form of glucose. But um, you know, this glycogen breakdown into um, and, and formation of lactate is really going to set about some important signaling processes in the body, okay? So um, what do I mean by that? So it is, for example, lactate, very important in neuroplasticity and formation of long-term memory. So I'll just give you some you know, brief examples here where they've done experiments in rodent models and basically they have the mice learn a task right it's either a maze test or um, one of those you know inhibitory uh, avoidance tests right so the avoidance test is this right they basically have some kind of chamber or box with two compartments in it. One is lit and one is dark. And if you put a mouse into that uh, lit side, it will want to run and hide in the dark. That's what mice like to do, right? It wants to do that. But when the mouse runs to the dark side, you actually deliver, once it enters the dark um, chamber, you deliver an electric shock. And the mouse goes, Zoof! That was really unpleasant and runs out and now it stays in the lit compartment okay and if you now test the mouse again the following day uh, generally they would have learned to avoid the dark side it was good to avoid the dark side but probably not when you're a mouse right but under these circumstances um, you know, if they were to go into the dark side, they remember, I might get a shock. That was pretty nasty and I'm not going there again, okay? So they have this uh, memory formation. So if you pharmacologically inhibit the breakdown of glycogen, right, in these mice models, then you inhibit lactate production. And what happens? They actually don't remember the shock that they got 
when they went into the dark chamber. Okay, so they go do 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 do, and they run back into the dark side. Ugh, get another shock. Okay, so they actually are unable to form that memory. Now, remember, we pharmacologically inhibited the breakdown of glycogen and therefore the formation of lactate. So now with that same situation, but now we're going to just add lactate back, just give them lactate. We actually rescue the situation. Under those circumstances, they do have that long-term memory consolidation and they do remember not to go into the dark chamber. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, and then there are um, other studies. So here's one that I thought was pretty interesting. The locus ceruleus in the brain is you know, important for sympathetic regulation and control. And we know that activation of beta adrenergic receptors there with norepinephrine would be very important in memory. Okay, so again, with the same test of the dark or the lit chamber, okay? Every time they go in the dark chamber, they get a little shock, so they learn, don't go there. Well, if you give, you inject pro, uh, propanolol, propranolol, sorry, which is a beta blocker, right, to those mice, in, in the brain, right, then actually, again, they don't learn, okay? So blocking the beta adrenergic receptors there um, really prevents them from having that long-term memory consolidation. But again, if you give lactate back, then guess what? You're going to rescue the situation and they are going to remember. Okay, now I just want to point out, if you gave, if you just gave glucose or you gave pyruvate, you just have marginal improvements, really not a big difference. It's when you give lactate that you um, allow that long-term memory consolidation, okay? So we're, really, we see that lactate is very important in memory, right? And it does a lot of other things. Um, you know, it's very important, just briefly mentioning this, uh, in the sleep-wake cycle, so it regulates um, neurons uh, that are responsible for, um, you know, physiological processes in your body like wakefulness, like feeding, um, thermogenesis, reward, and so forth, okay? So lactate in uh, those neurons, very, very important. We see some beneficial effects of lactate. Um, and for that reason, people have begun sort of experimenting with giving lactate um, to populations in, in, in animal models, but also I think in in humans now, the people are starting to, you know, think about replacing lactate in humans. Okay, so we have something called um, brain microdialysis, which is really useful in really letting us um, monitor uh, and learn about the neurotransmitters in the interstitial space, right? The interstitial tissue fluids in the, in the brain, okay? And essentially, this is what you do. You take a probe, right? And that probe has a membrane. And of course, the membrane, you can determine different pore sizes in the membrane. And, you know, the pore size you determine will regulate the size of particles that can cross that membrane, of course, all right? So you have this, um, you know, microtubule that you introduce, has the membrane there, and then you pass at a very slow flow rate, you pass a solute, right, a solution through that. And then as you go through that area, then uh, molecules in the interstitial fluid can diffuse through the membrane, depending again on the size, right? And then in the outflow uh, part, you can pick up that fluid and analyze what's in there, okay? So this microdialysis, brain microdialysis, 
is useful in helping us monitor these different substances that may be present in the interstitial fluid in the brain. And um, they've actually done this in traumatic brain injury or TBIs, okay? And what they noticed was that actually with TBI, you tend to see increased lactate in the brain, okay? Increased lactate. But there, there are fine differences, okay? If you have increased lactate under low uh, partial oxygen, right? Pressure of oxygen, so low oxygen conditions, then that usually is a poor pros, uh, uh, prognosis for the patient, okay? It's not a good sign because when you see that, it's generally anaerobic um, glycolysis that's happening, okay? And that lactate is forming under anaerobic uh, conditions. But if you see normal oxygen and increased lactate, that's a good sign, all right? And those um, patients do better, okay? That they have a better outcome. And so there are studies now that are looking at giving lactate to people with different brain injuries, whether it's stroke, uh, or traumatic brain injury, okay? And essentially, they give people peripheral lactate, right? And, um, and, and peripheral, so you can inject it into the bloodstream, for example, and that's peripheral, right? But we do see increase in lactate in the brain when you administer the lactate peripherally, okay? And you know that lactate, obviously, as you put it into the bloodstream, it can go to different places. It probably will go into the liver, okay? And from the liver, we can take some of that lactate and convert it to glucose, right? Gluconeogenesis. Um, and you know that might increase blood glucose levels and therefore increase uh, glucose in the brain and then you know, those astrocytes can take up that glucose and make more lactate. So that's one way we could access more lactate in the brain, but you can also see higher lactate levels uh, going into the brain. And now we have more lactate for the neurons to use. And, you know, under conditions of injury, that lactate will be important for healing and for dealing with the traumatic insult, okay? Interestingly, um, we've also seen lactate being used now in some um, psychiatric disorders like depression, okay? This is only in animal models, so very preliminary, but I just thought it was interesting where they looked at rodent models of depression and you know you can't really ask a mouse if they're you can ask them but you're probably not going to get a response and if you get a response you might want to hmm, check out your neuropsychiatric situation as well but okay what you can see is these behaviors uh maybe like decreased feeding for example and immo uh, immobility in animal models, okay? So they have something called a forced swim test. And in this, they kind of drop the mouse in water and then, you know, in order to survive, it really has to swim. And they kind of let it swim and they see how long um, it swims before giving up. Now in rodents that have sort of these depressive behaviors, they don't swim very long. They just kind of give up very easily. They're not very motivated. So you drop them one and they go paddle, paddle, and they kind of give up and sink, all right? Um, but actually, when they give lactate, and I want to emphasize they gave peripheral lactate. They didn't inject it into the brain. They gave it in the bloodstream, peripheral lactate to um, those mice, and it increased their forced swim time. So it decreased immobility in those animals, which I thought was really interesting, okay? And might uh, prompt in the future 
studies in, um, in humans, okay? So there's so many things and so many questions still that uh, remain to be answered when we look at this model of the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle uh, and the functions of lactate. And um, they bring up a lot of questions for me. I'm gonna save those questions for another time. But I again want to point out that we are just looking now at this coupling between neurons and astrocytes and different things may be happening in different glial cells. So maybe microglia are doing something else, right? And also depends on the situation as well, right? Under conditions of inflammation, maybe we have certain things, certain metabolic processes going on. And when we have a normal uh, brain situation, then we have different metabolic processes going on. So as you can see, it's really hard to separate out all these spe cell specific metabolic processes because, you know, it's only been very recent that we've learned to look at the specific cells and what's going on in them. And I want to point out also, again, just to emphasize that it's not, it never is, all or nothing, okay? So it doesn't mean that those neurons aren't taking up some glucose, right? I did say that most of the glucose is taken up by the astrocytes, but that doesn't mean the neuron isn't taking up any glucose. It's taking up some glucose as well and, you know, running it through the Krebs, okay? And in uh, the astrocytes, we also have some oxidative respiration going on. It's not only glycolysis, right? That we actually maybe have a little bit of oxidative metabolism going on as well. So it's never all or nothing. It's generally the spectrum, and, but we tend to see more of the glycolytic uh, processes going on and lactate formation in the astrocyte, and we see more oxidative processes going on in the neuron. Okay, time for our wrap up. So, what did we start with? Oh, we talked about um, basically glucose being the obligate energy substrate for the brain and um, you absolutely need glucose for the brain to function. We can use ketone bodies as a fuel, but it doesn't 100% replace the glucose, okay? So how does glucose get into the brain? It's through those GLUT transporters, GLUT1 and GLUT3. GLUT3, generally you see more neurons, GLUT1 in the glial cells, okay? Actually, one other thing I want to point out here is sometimes I get this question of, well, you know, when, when um, your blood sugar levels are low, then that's dangerous for the brain. And that, that's, that's probably true when you have hypoglycemia, that's not good for the brain, right? And so um, I hear this term, I hear this term um, being used. And so your body is deliberately insulin resistant to prioritize the glucose for the brain. Well, you know, when we talk about insulin and glucose transport, as I said before, we're talking about GLUT4, okay, which we see in muscle and fat, and it also has its impact in, in the liver. Now, the, there's something called the KM. And this tells us about the substrate affinity for those transporters, okay? The lower the KM, the higher the affinity for the substrate. So the KM for GLUT3 is a lot lower than the KM for GLUT4. So under conditions of low glucose, right, you're still going to have preferential, preferential binding to GLUT3 because the KM is a lot lower than GLUT4. So your body has a way to protect your brain um, under conditions where you haven't eaten for a while and your blood sugar is running kind of low, okay? So anyway, uh, glucose gets into the brain and we've learned now that even though 
neurons actually take up most of the energy consumption in the brain. Really, at rest, they're not taking in that much glucose. At best, they're taking in the same amount as the astrocytes. And we find out that really when those neurons are activated, okay, the glucose uptake is mostly by astrocytes, right? And we tend to have more glycolysis going on in the astrocytes and more oxphorus going on in the neurons, okay? So the astrocytes are going to take in the glucose, run through glycolysis, and then preferentially make lactate, okay? We can take that pyruvate, and in some cases, they probably take some of that pyruvate and run it into the Krebs cycle, but preferentially, we are going to actually move the pyruvate into lactate, and that's because of different enzyme profiles between astrocytes and neurons, right, that kind of drive the reaction that way, and also because the NADH, NAD ratio also drives the reaction towards formation of lactate, and also, you know, in terms of the mitochondrial respiratory chain complexes, uh, we have uncoupling of uh, complex one from the super complexes, and so mitochondrial respiration is not very efficient, and, and, and we're we actually tend to rely on glycolysis um, for generation of energy in the astrocyte, okay? So when you have activation of the neuron and we release glutamate, neurotransmitter glutamate, into the synaptic space. Some of it obviously gets taken up by the postsynaptic membranes, but most of it is in the space and needs to be removed. And the cell that is doing the removal will be the astrocyte. The astrocyte will, at a cost, an energy cost, bring that glutamate, glutamate into itself and convert that glutamate to glutamine, okay? And that's gonna cost some energy. That glutamine can now be uh, brought out into the extracellular space where the neuron can take it up again to make more glutamate, okay? But it, as I said, it costs some energy for the cell and it gets that energy, the astrocyte, through formation of lactate. Also, when you depolarize the neuron membrane, then you have a lot of extracellular potassium and that potassium has to be taken up by the astrocyte so we can reset the membrane potential in the neuron. So again, astrocyte to the rescue mops up the extracellular uh, potassium. And um, there are other things that will actually drive the formation of lactate. Besides extracellular potassium, we have things like nitric oxide, which um, you know the neurons can make. We have, um, you know, NH4+, okay? And also other neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and VIP and adenosine and, and ATP, right? They can drive, guess what? The breakdown of glycogen, which is found in astrocytes, primarily in the brain. So they can drive the breakdown of glycogen uh, in the astrocyte, run that glucose through glycolysis and then into pyruvate and then make lactate from that pyruvate, okay? So we're again prioritizing the formation of lactate and we're generating some energy that way for the astrocyte. And I forgot to say this, many people think that that's also a way for the astrocyte to prioritize glucose for the neuron, okay? So it's gonna say, I'm gonna take the glycogen and break it down, and I will use the lactate um, as an energy you know, substrate, okay? But that means that any glucose that is coming into the brain is prioritized for uptake by the neuron. So we are, again, you know, making sure that the neuron gets its supply of of glucose. That lactate um, can be transported out of the astrocyte into the extracellular space and then, and that's through MCT1 uh, and MCT4. Okay, MCT1 and MCT4 
they again we talked about the km right the substrate affinity is low for lactate okay and extrudes the lactate into the extracellular space the neuron actually has mct2 which has very high affinity uh, for lactate and so it's gonna mop up that lactate bring it into uh, the cell and then use that to make pyruvate that pyruvate can then enter into the Krebs cycle okay so that's how we um, uh, utilize the lactate in the neuron and incidentally your muscles also have uh, MCT1 okay so it's really um, similar the astrocytes in so many ways to muscle muscle also has um, lactate dehydrogenase 5 okay so we see we see lactate dehydrogenase 5 in tissues or cells that make lactate okay and in in cells that consume lactate we tend to see lactate dehydrogenase 1 okay like the myocardium okay so yeah i just find that really interesting some of the parallels between astrocyte and muscle there okay um and then we talked about how besides being a fuel lactate is also a signaling molecule it's very important in memory memory formation it's very important also in some physiological processes sleep wake cycle feeding behaviors you know thermogenesis uh reward that kind of thing and um maybe useful uh, in cases of brain injury, whether stroke or um, traumatic brain injury, and perhaps even in something like depression. So stay tuned, okay? I mean, we've talked about giving um, ketone bodies um, to people with neurodegenerative disorders, and hmm, I wonder what would happen if we gave lactate. Right? So some questions there. And I'd love to talk to you more about this. So uh, go to my website, vivianlowmd.com, V-Y-V-Y-A-N-E-L-O-H-M-D.com and sign up for the newsletter first. Also, there under events, you can find out when the next live Q&A session would be. And it'd be really great to have you there so we can chat about some of the things that we've discussed in these episodes, if you want to talk to me about brain metabolism, um, that'd be a lot of fun as well. Okay, I hope that was helpful and I hope, Eveline, that was um, interesting to you. So signing out now from VLMD Rounds, I'm Dr. Vivian Lowe and I sing the body electric. Bye.